All right, uh, then let us continue with effective field theory. We are currently discussing renormalization, and in the last lecture, we discussed calculation of loop diagrams using the method of dimensional regularization, and I gave you the very basic definitions. And in particular, we discussed how we can calculate basic one-loop integrals with numerator equal to one, but the nominators consisting out of the usual propagators from Feynman diagrams. And now we just extend this towards loop integrals with a non-trivial numerator. In other words, where the numerator can depend on the integration momentum. Such integrals are so-called tensor integrals. And the claim is that you never really need to compute these tensor integrals explicitly. You can, of course, if you want to, but it is in principle always possible to algebraically reduce them to scalar integrals without such numerators. And I will give you here two methods which are generally applicable uh, in order to achieve this purpose. The first very general method is called integration by parts. And I will just illustrate it with the help of one example. And the example is simply, you take uh, an integral over a total derivative, derivative with respect to the integration momentum, d by dk mu and an integral over k. And we have said that in dimensional regularization, uh, we always have shift invariance. Therefore, such an integral is always zero. So. That means let us calculate an example with a non-trivial numerator k nu and in the denominator simply uh, something like this k square minus m square. Then evaluating the derivative under the integral sign gives us two terms because of the product rule and uh, the two terms then add up to zero and this forms a relationship which we can use in order to eliminate numerators. So let's work it out. The first factor is uh, k nu in the numerator. Derivative of this with respect to the integration momentum simply gives the metric tensor g mu nu divided by k square minus m square. And uh, the other term comes from the denominator and it gives us minus uh, the inner derivative is 2k mu. Then we have 2k mu k nu in the numerator. And in the denominator, we have k squared minus m squared squared. Okay, and this is our relationship. Here we have now an integral, which is a scalar integral. The numerator is um, g mu nu, which is a constant and can be pulled out of, of the integral. And here we have a tensor integral. with a non-trivial numerator, namely a second order polynomial in the integration momentum. And uh, the two add up to zero, therefore we have a relationship between the two integrals. And just also to practice the naming convention, this integral here is by our naming convention, g mu nu times an a0 function, a0 of m. And this integral by our naming convention is b mu nu with the argument p m m twice the same mass, uh, sorry, uh, zero momentum because there is no incoming momentum. And uh, so we have derived exactly this relationship between these two particular loop integrals. And so reading from right to left, we have reduced a tensor integral to a scalar integral and even not only the numerator, but also the denominator has become simpler in the process. So, and this method of integration by parts is generally applicable. It's not always as simple as in this example, but it is applicable in all cases in all order to reduce all possible uh, integrals with a numerator to ones without. Let me present also a second possibility, which is called Passarino-Feldman.
which is not as yeah. It's uh, the factor of two in the numerator. Oh. So sorry, yes, that is important. And uh, as you remember, hopefully, the relationship was that this is equal to i divided by 16 pi square times the loop function, and I cancelled the i over 16 pi square in the equation. So Passarino-Feldman is another method which is um, in particular good at one loop order and sometimes also at higher orders. Anyway, um, this is our BMU function and uh, in this approach we do an ansatz, a so-called covariant decomposition. which means that we ask ourselves what are the possible covariant objects giving the Lorentz index mu in the result. And we need a result with one Lorentz index. Obviously, the whole thing is Lorentz covariant. And therefore, um, in this case, it must be proportional to the momentum p mu since there is no other Lorentz covariant with one index available. Yeah. And in more general cases, um, you might have to think which such covariance exists. But here there is only one, and therefore there is only one option, which is that uh, our function B mu with the argument P m1 m2 must uh, be written as the momentum P mu times a scalar object. And this scalar object now has a name B1, and it can only depend on scalars like P square M1 and M2. So this is a scalar function. And uh, what has changed is that the argument is only the square, P square. And so uh, this is an ansatz. How can we use the ansatz? The idea is that we now go back into the original equation and we can simplify by uh, generating a Lorentz invariant quantity out of this and we can um, generate something Lorentz invariant by multiplying once again with another p mu in this particular case. So we multiply with p mu and uh, then simplify the integrand So what does it mean? Our i divided by 16 pi square times b mu becomes, uh, sorry, times, um, so, so we multiply with p mu and uh, then maybe let's multiply with two times b mu. Then what we get is definitely two p square times i divided by 16 pi square b1 so uh, we get a scalar multiplied with our function b1. And on the other hand, we can do it under the integral, and then we get the integral 2p dot k in the numerator, and in the denominator we have our two propagators, k square minus m1 square, k plus p square minus m2 square, and we have a scalar in the numerator. And why is this useful? So the general trick that can now always be applied in this um, Passarino-Feldman method is that this here can be written as a combination of factors which appear in the denominator. This always works. So we can always express it in terms of denominators. So here in this case, um, basically, let's write the denominators as a product d1 times d2 with an obvious notation. d1 is this factor, d2 is the other factor. Then the 2pk appears here in the scalar product, k, k plus p square. And so we can write the 2p dot k as the denominator d2 minus k square uh, sorry, minus, uh, sorry, plus m square. Then we have uh, a little bit too much. So that is 
k square plus p square plus 2k dot p. The k square also appears here, so we do minus d1 plus m1 square, that is k square. So then uh, what we have is p square plus 2p dot k, so we also subtract minus p square, and then this is identical to 2p dot k. Okay. And then we have expressed our entire numerator in terms of denominators and constants. These are constants which we can pull out of the integral. And these objects we can cancel. Therefore, without any additional calculation, we get the following relationship, namely 2p square b1 is equal to the following. The first term cancels d2 and we get only an integral over the first denominator. What is the integral over the first denominator, k square minus m1 square? It's an a0 function with which argument? m1. Then let's look at the d1 term first. d1 cancels and we get 1 over d2. What does it give? It gives an other a0 function with the argument m2. So we can first shift the integration momentum. So we get minus a0 of m2. And then we have constant m2, m minus m1 minus p square times 1 over both denominators, which is a b0 function. So plus m2 square minus m1 square minus p square times b0. And that's it. We have now reduced our tensor integral to this combination of scalar integrals. And so here we have 2p square b1. We can trivially divide by 2p square. Then we have b1. We can plug in b1, multiply with p mu, and then we have our b mu. This is the solution. So I have shown you now an example how the passerino feldman <coughs> method reduces arbitrary integrals with um, integration momenta in the numerator <coughs> to integrals without um, such numerators. And this always works at the one loop level. So these are two nice ways to deal with tensor integrals and therefore we have now everything that we need for arbitrary one loop calculations, namely the master formula, which gives us integrals with general k square minus something in the denominator. We have Feynman parameters, which reduces every scalar integral to the master formula. And we have two methods to get rid of tensor integrals and therefore we have everything. Okay, the next section is renormalization. And as in the general chapter, I will be brief and practical, but nevertheless also precise and complete. Basically what I will give you is a blueprint uh, for how renormalization works and why it works without giving you all the proofs and uh, without giving many examples because uh, the lecture will consist of many, many examples in the next weeks. Let us begin with a few simple observations and collect uh, one or two ideas. Here you see a relationship which you know from basic quantum field theory, namely you have canonical quantization and operators should satisfy such a commutation relation, which means that uh, the right hand side of operator products give us delta functions. Delta functions are mathematically so-called distributions, not actually functions. That means the field operators in quantum field theory themselves must be regarded as distributions instead of uh, ordinary operators. So these are so-called operator valued distributions. Mm -hmm. 
what do you know about distributions? Uh, probably a lot, but one thing that you probably know is that you actually cannot multiply distributions. Distributions must be multiplied with test functions and then integrated, but you cannot multiply distributions. For example, delta of x squared doesn't make sense. However, what uh, appears in our Lagrangian, there appear things like this. That is not good. These are products of such operator value distributions and therefore these are ill-defined. operator products. And this gives you immediately the hint that because of the locality of quantum field theory, which is at the core of both relationships, uh, we can get some mathematical difficulties and these manifest themselves in the divergencies of loop integrals at very high momenta, which is equivalent to very short distance scales, in other words, to locality. So in summary, expressions which appear in canonically quantized quantum field theory are often ill-defined. If you take them very literally, what is therefore the idea the, the idea that we have is actually very simple, namely we regard quantum field theory um, not as literally a canonically quantized quantum structure, but it is defined by a limiting procedure. Let's say you take um, a limit ultimately of some parameter epsilon going to zero, but what do you take the limit of? You construct first a family of theories which depend on some regularization parameter epsilon uh, and for each of those family of or each member of this family of theories for epsilon non-zero let's say uh, we assume that canonical quantization kind of works and we get uh, well-defined expressions. And our derivations of, for example, Feynman rules are correct. So we have such a family of theories and uh, ultimately we take the limit epsilon going to zero so we remove the regularization out of this family of theories but in the limit where epsilon becomes zero maybe canonical quantization becomes ill-defined however at epsilon being non-zero uh, all the quantities that we write down are well-defined. And so. Uh, the physical outcome is only the limiting case for which canonical quantization is just an idealization. And of course, in this limit, the limit epsilon going to zero should exist and satisfy the usual um, quantum mechanics and quantum field theory axioms. So it should provide a sensible, physically meaningful quantum theory, um, even though it is defined in terms of such a limiting procedure. So that is the basic idea of renormalization. So we switch on a regularization as an intermediate step as long as epsilon is non-zero. Of course the theory will have some unphysical properties, otherwise we wouldn't need the regularization or we could take the regularization as real. Um, but uh, it normally has some unphysical properties, but in the limit epsilon going to zero, 
uh, divergences cancel and we obtain a physically finite and meaningful theory. That is the first observation and idea. Let us now collect one more concrete observation from one loop calculation. So the ultraviolet divergences um, have to do with n equal one or two in the master formula. And we have seen that we can reduce all one loop integrals to the master formula. Therefore, we know precisely which integrals have a divergence. Um, namely, n equal one and two can be uh, translated into the requirement that we have power counting divergent integrals. So we can define a so-called power counting degree of divergence, small d, which is simply the number of powers of k in the numerator minus the number of powers of k in the denominator. And uh, if this degree of divergence is zero, then we have something like dk over k, which is logarithmically divergent. If d is bigger than zero, then we have a linearly or quadratically divergent integral. And if d is smaller than zero, we have a finite integral. So the uv divergences appear exactly if d is bigger or equal to zero. That is the first observation. So this degree of divergence, which you naively obtain by simply counting powers of the integration momentum, that is really um, the only criterion that is required. And you can use this same definition, by the way, also at the multi-loop level. Um, where you simply have many loop momenta and you simply count the overall number of loop momenta in the numerator minus the overall number of power in the denominator and then you get also a degree of divergence for multi-loop integrals. But for those it is not obvious at all, for sure not from our discussion, whether the same criterion holds. That is not clear at all. But at the one loop level it is obvious from all we have said. Now let us uh, collect a second observation, which is specific to one loop. Namely, let me write here a typical one loop integral, which contains a factor which looks like this, k plus p square minus m square and some other factors. Okay, and uh, maybe this is divergent. All right, now let us hit this integral with a derivative d by dm square. What happens? First of all, I already told you that it's a property of dimensional regularization that such derivatives always commute with the integral, so you can apply it under the integral sign. And then what happens? Actually, the minus cancels because of the inner derivative. So we get simply the same factors as before, but k plus p square minus m square square. But what does uh, it tell you in more generality if you think of the previous discussion on divergences and power counting? d is reduced by two. So it means if previously your power counting degree was any integer, whatever it is, you can apply a few mass derivatives and ultimately after a finite number of mass derivatives you get something which is power counting divergent, uh, finite, and therefore it is actually finite. So the divergence that you had initially 
become zero after you hit it with a finite number of mass derivatives. What does that mean? What kind of function exists which becomes zero after a finite number of derivatives? Polynomial. It is a polynomial. So this shows us that the uh, uh, divergence initially must have been a polynomial in the mass of finite degree. Actually, of which degree at most? At most of the degree which is equal to the degree of divergence. Let's do another derivative with respect to p mu. What happens if you do it the same with p mu? So the same happens, namely, it's a little bit more complicated, but you also get the denominator square. And in the numerator, we have now a 2 k dot p. Uh, no, um, 2 k plus p mu. Okay, so the power counting degree is also reduced, but by one. So, but again, if you hit your integral with a finite number of momentum derivatives, then you also um, get something which is definitely finite. Therefore, it means the initial divergence must have been a polynomial in the external momentum of degree at most equal to the degree of divergence. You had a question? Um, no. Okay. So let's summarize this. The initial ultraviolet divergence must be a polynomial in P and M of degree D at most. So that is really an established theorem for the one loop level, but I recall it's only obvious at the one loop level. But it is very important. And actually something similar will hold at the multi-loop level as well. Any questions? Some of you do not seem convinced. So do you have some comments or questions? Uh, at higher loop levels, you have subdivergencies. For example, something like this. Suppose you have here a mass m, um, but here you have some other mass m1. Then, uh, regardless of how many times you take a derivative with respect to this mass m, uh, that never changes, and it is always remains divergent. Therefore, you would conclude from such a diagram that even after infinitely many derivatives with respect to M, the diagram remains divergent. So you conclude the diagram has a divergence which is not a polynomial in the masses as an example. Yeah. Okay, but then could I just take derivatives with respect to M1? Yeah, but uh, the statement is it's not a polynomial in M, maybe. Mm. So you cannot say that the divergence is a polynomial in all the masses of the diagram. Here, it is a, obviously a polynomial, so you, this is kind of, op it's just exemplification, but it's obvious that you can prove in this way that every divergence of every one loop integral is a polynomial in all the masses and all the external momenta of the diagram. And that is just, it is not the case at the two loop level. But there is nevertheless a statement which is a little bit similar but it's a more complicated statement. Similarly here, um, maybe uh, the power counting degree of divergence can be negative. Nevertheless, a two-loop diagram could have a sub-divergence. For example, if you have here um, many external lines, 
the overall number of loop momenta in the denominator is extremely high because of so many propagators, but uh, the inner loop is always divergent. Therefore, it's not enough to count overall the number of uh, integration momenta in the numerator minus denominators because a diagram might still have a subdivergence even if overall it looks finite. This is the so-called subdivergence. But again, could one remedy this just by counting the powers of the different loop Yes. So you would then uh, easily see that uh, there is a subdiagram which has a positive degree of divergence and therefore has a divergence, indeed. But the statement is that uh, this degree of divergence is not sufficient anymore to um, check the divergence of the diagram. And of course, there would be more complicated ways to um, identify subdivergences clearly, but that is exactly the point. We need to do this. It becomes more complicated. Okay. This is just a collection of simple observations and ideas, but we should keep that in mind in order to see what happens in the general case. general theorems and practical procedure, how do you renormalize in general at the multi-loop level? What we say is specific for dimensional regularization, which is of course in practice the most important scheme. And uh, we use perturbation theory of course. So. Uh, what is necessary is that you uh, renormalize your theory uh, at, in principle, all loop orders. And uh, in principle, you might want to calculate uh, quantities, physical observables also at all loop orders. And you must do that iteratively by starting at three level. Then you do one loop calculations, one loop renormalization. You need to use the one loop results to do two loop calculations and two loop renormalization and so on. So it is an iterative process. And let us begin by starting this iteration. So let us say we are now at loop level number n which is zero or bigger than zero. So maybe we have already uh, done some work. And we assume, so let the theory be correctly renormalized at this loop level. Up to order N. When I say order N in this chapter, it means N loop level. What do I mean when I say correctly renormalized? It means two things. First of all, um, if N equals zero, it means we are at three level or at the classical level. because loop diagrams are proportional to h bar. So we are at a three level. Then the theory is defined by the classical Lagrangian, which is the Lagrangian that you simply write down by L. And to make it clear, I often uh, have a subscript CL for a classical. But in this context, I will also call it L with a superscript zero in brackets, which is obviously the zeroth order of our iteration. And this Lagrangian is a local Lagrangian, local expression in terms of our fields and its derivatives. It is relativistic and also Hermitian. And uh, it determines the Feynman rules. 
So if um, n is bigger than zero, then we have already done some work uh, up to the n loop level that uh, in this case we assume we have already constructed the renormalization up to this order. And uh, what that means is that we do not only have the classical Lagrangian, but we have something that we call bare Lagrangian. A bare Lagrangian defined up to the order n, which I denote as bracket n superscript. And this is a combination of the classical Lagrangian L0 plus a so-called counterterm Lagrangian, CT stands for counterterm, with index one for one loop, plus and so on, this uh, counterterm with superscript n. And uh, the superscript without bracket means strictly n loop counterterm Lagrangian, and the superscript n in brackets means up to n loop. So we have constructed in our iteration so-called counter terms, which are additional terms in the Lagrangian, which uh, are, uh, have coefficients of one loop, two loop, and so on order, and which in total provide a modified Lagrangian, which however is still local relativistic and Hermitian. And all of these Lagrangians are defined, since we work in dimensional regularization, in uh, D unequal to four dimensions, which means that we work in dimensional regularization. So in all these cases, regardless whether we work at three level or at higher orders, uh, we have a Lagrangian at our disposal, and the Lagrangian generates Feynman rules in the usual way. So we have a set of Feynman rules, uh, which in general include so-called counterterm Feynman rules. And the theory is defined by these um, d-dimensional Feynman rules. Okay, so this is the first item uh, in our assumption that we need at the n-loop level. And the second item is the property of the theory at the n-loop level. So we have constructed these counter terms and uh, the so-called bare Lagrangian. And what is its property? It makes the theory finite, of course. So this is the statement that up to the order n, the theory is finite. That means, uh, let's say, for example, at the order n equal to two loop level, uh, we would have, for example, the following situation that we can perform the limit epsilon going to zero of the following. For example, we take a two loop Feynman diagram in QED. It might look like this. This is the photon self energy at the two loop level. Two external photons, an electron loop, and another photon, which is a nice two loop diagram. We add to it, of course, all other two loop diagrams but we also add diagrams which are of two loop order and which involve a counter term coming from our one loop counter term Lagrangian. Such a counter term could look like the following Feynman rule, namely in the counter term Lagrangian, there might be a term which gives rise to this Feynman rule, again, photon, electron, electron, but with a coefficient which is of one loop order. Therefore, this diagram is of two loop order. And here we have a vertex from the one loop counter term Lagrangian. Plus, of course, all other 
uh, one loop uh, diagrams with one loop counter term insertions. And ultimately, we also add a diagram like this, where this here is a vertex from the two loop counter term Lagrangian. So this is a two loop counter term. In this case, it would be a term which has just two photon fields attached to it, some operator with two photon fields, and uh, a coefficient which is of two loop order. And then all of these diagrams are of two loop order. They are all added up, and if you add them up, then the limit epsilon going to zero exists. And this then defines the physical result for the photon self-energy at the two loop level. So this is the statement that the theory is finite, uh, and uh, so this should work, of course, for all um, Feynman diagrams and all green functions. So this is the start of our iteration. So we have already worked up to this point, such that at some arbitrary n-loop level, the theory has become finite by adding certain counter terms. And now let us discuss what we need to do in order to go to the next order and then also how to uh, use this um, approach and um, the uh, construction to calculate physical quantities. So the procedure at order n plus one, uh, let's say begin, so you now want to work at uh, the next order, for example, at the three loop level. So what you need to do is first of all to compute Feynman diagrams. Uh, and uh, it's sufficient to work with one particle irreducible Feynman diagrams of order n plus one loop level. And uh, you have the Feynman rules at your disposal with counter terms up to order n. So you compute these diagrams with the Feynman rules uh, from the Bayer Lagrangian up to the order n. And uh, as an example, let's say n plus 1 is 3. So that continues this example here. This is now established. Now, what can we do with it at the three loop level? At the three loop level, for example, we can calculate an electron self energy in QED, electron self energy with a photon loop. And um, so it could be this Feynman diagram where you have an electron self energy with a photon loop, but the photon itself undergoes a two loop correction it undergoes the two loop correction from here. So then this would be a three loop diagram and uh, you need to calculate the electron self energy at the three loop level using the Feynman rules from before. That means uh, you must automatically add to this also such diagrams. So in this case you would add here this diagram with a one loop counter term insertion plus this diagram with a two loop counter term insertion. Then all of these diagrams are of three loop order. And of course, you must be complete. You need to add all diagrams of this kind. And uh, then you obtain a result which is probably not finite because we have not yet renormalized our theory at the three loop level. And, but we need to compute uh, the result of such Feynman diagrams first and then uh, pro, uh, continue, yes. In the diagram in the middle, do I need to add up uh, another diagram where the other vertices? Yes, are yes, yes. And there are many more diagrams. Um, for example, there would be also such diagrams where a counter term is here, where the counter term is there, where the counter term is here, where the counter term is here and here, everywhere. There are many such diagrams and you need to add all of them. You must be complete. You must calculate 
all diagrams of this order using all Feynman rules from the previous uh, iteration step. And there will be all such diagrams. If you make a mistake, you will see it, uh, and how you will see it, we will soon discuss. You will inevitably uh, obtain results which can't be correct, and uh, we will discuss how you can uh, see this. Okay, so you do this, you obtain some result, you write it down into a Mathematica file or whatever, and uh, now, there are two theorems which I want to explain to you, which apply uh, and which are relevant to discuss the results that you might or might not obtain here. So the first theorem, let's call it theorem one, is a theorem which comes from, um, let's say, a theoretical approach, which is often called causal perturbation theory. And this is associated with Bogolyubov uh, and collaborators. It's basically already written in the ordinary Bogolyubov quantum field theory textbook. And it has been uh, made more mathematical by Epstein Glaser. And this approach tells us the following. I already alluded to it in the exercise, namely in any approach to regularization and renormalization and loop calculations, the imaginary parts of uh, these Feynman diagrams and of green functions are not arbitrary, but they are fixed by a very physical requirement. Namely, by which requirement are they fixed? How we, we remember? Yeah. By the optical theorem, in other words, more generally speaking, by unitarity of the S matrix uh, or unitarity of time evolution. So the imaginary parts are fixed by the optical theorem or by unitarity. And uh, therefore, um, whenever you have a correct procedure, the imaginary parts must always come out in agreement with uh, the requirements of the optical theorem. Therefore, in principle, by the way, um, you do not have to do the three loop calculation explicitly by evaluating loop integrals. You could just uh, go to the optical theorem and actually really use it to determine the imaginary part directly. And then you circumvent the calculation of those diagrams and you also will not encounter divergences, but you only get the imaginary part. That's what he did in his bachelor thesis. So uh, this gives you the imaginary part and they are unambiguous. How about the real parts? The real parts are also to a large extent fixed by physics. The real parts are fixed and that gives the name to the approach, namely they are fixed by causality. Causality, you can prove um, gives rise to analyticity of the green functions, which are determined by Feynman diagrams in a very specific way. So uh, if you regard all the Feynman diagrams and green functions as functions of momenta and masses, and all of the arguments are taken as complex variables in the complex plane, then the functions must have certain analyticity properties following from causality, which is implemented, for example, in the so-called Kellin-Lehmann representation. Which is one way how to see this connection. Um, so the real parts are then fixed 
by analyticity, and analyticity uh, uh, mathematically simply means that, of course, the imaginary part and the real part are not independent of each other. If you know the imaginary part, you know a lot about the real part. However, you do not know the real part completely, because there are functions which are completely real, and they would not change the relationship between imaginary and real parts, for example, polynomials. And that means that the real parts are fixed up to polynomials. Up to polynomials in external momenta. And uh, often we think in terms of Lagrangians. If we are in momentum space, a polynomial uh, in momenta becomes a local expression in the Lagrangian with a finite number of derivatives because momenta become derivatives. So, uh, and then a polynomial is a local uh, term in the Lagrangian. So we can say the real parts are fixed up to local terms. We can add local real terms. So the only thing which is not fixed by these deep physical principles, unitarity and causality, are local terms, which uh, are exactly the terms which can be written in a Lagrangian. Everything else is uh, fixed by unitarity and causality. Imaginary parts <coughs> and non-local terms are fixed. So uh, that is the first theorem, which is general and not only valid in dimensional regularization, but in any approach to renormalization, because it just comes from analysis of physics. Then the second theorem, which applies to dimensional regularization, and it comes from Speer and also from Brighton, Lona, Meison. is the following statement on dimensional regularization. Now it is the following theorem, let me write it here. In dimensional regularization, first of all, the imaginary parts um, and uh, the non-polynomial real parts are correct. That is the first very important and non-trivial statement. So, and this is the theorem which I mean when I say that dimensional regularization is one of the possible consistent regularization schemes because it is consistent with unitarity and causality in the sense that it provides the correct output which is required by those physical conditions. And if you would invent your own regularization method, uh, then you would have to check the same statement. For example, there was this clever student who was not really satisfied with divergencies in quantum field theory. And he said that, okay, uh, since we anyway are dealing with uh, uh, unreasonable mathematics, why do we not just set all the integrals which are divergent to zero? Okay, if you set everything to zero which is divergent, what is so bad about this choice? And here is the answer. By setting integrals to zero, which are divergent, you kill uh, the necessary imaginary and non-local real parts, so such a procedure would not be compatible with unitarity and causality of um, quantum field theory. Therefore, uh, you must do something more advanced than simply dropping everything which is divergent. Okay, so uh, dimensional regularization is correct in this sense. Then, the alt and this is basically uh, what Speer uh, said immediately in his paper. Uh, now, uh, detail about the ultraviolet divergencies. And uh, the statement about the ultraviolet divergencies, in short, is that at the multi-loop level, if you do it like I described, for the final result, it is exactly as at one loop order. 
So the divergences are again um, polynomials in the masses and momenta. And they are one over epsilon poles as at one loop order. But this result is only true after you add all these uh, Feynman diagrams with counter terms of lower orders. So these Feynman diagrams are important to cancel these subdivergencies which appear in the three loop diagram. And after you have canceled all the subdivergencies, what remains is a structure which is similar to one loop. So let's write this down. The ultraviolet divergencies are polynomials. First of all, uh, in one over epsilon, in one over epsilon, and uh, we also know the degree of the polynomial, namely the degree is the loop number, up to one over epsilon to the power n minus one. So we are currently working at the n plus one loop level. And uh, for every loop, we get one, uh, one over epsilon pole. So we have a polynomial in one over epsilon up to this term. And at one loop, of course, only one over epsilon. Now, what are the coefficients of all the one over epsilon terms? This is a polynomial in the masses and momenta, so the coefficients of these one over epsilon to the i are polynomials in the external momenta and the masses, but I will say a footnote on the masses here later on, and, uh, but definitely in the external momenta. And we also know the degree of the polynomial, namely it is like at one loop. The degree of the polynomial is simply the overall degree of divergence of the entire green function by simply counting all uh, factors in the numerator and all factors in the denominator, um, collecting all loop momenta um, simultaneously. So this is then often called a superficial degree of divergence in order to distinguish it to degree of divergence of subdiagrams or whatever. So, this is the main statement. You know how many one over epsilon poles appear and you also know that there are no other singularities like logarithm of epsilon, stuff like this doesn't exist in dimensional regularization and the coefficients are polynomials in the external momenta. So now the statement on the masses. Um, it can happen that you decide that in these counter term Feynman rules you incorporate as a coefficient of such a counter term logarithm of a mass. Just decide uh, for it. And if you do that, then uh, of course this statement is ruined by your choice of the counter terms. This is a possible choice. Um, but it, it cannot be a possible choice to choose counter terms which are logarithms of the momenta because you cannot write down a logarithm of a momentum as a local term in a Lagrangian but you can have a term in the Lagrangian phi square times ln m. That of course in principle exists. So uh, unless L counter term contains other functions of m. So, but this box here is a very important and extremely powerful statement on multi-loop calculations in dimensional regularization, and it basically explains the procedure of renormalization at all orders. Yes. One loop level, we had the, um, the fact that the coefficient of the one over epsilon and the coefficient of the physical mass or, or the physical carbon was the same, and we argued that that would be a one loop always. The, the coefficient of mu square, you mean, ln mu square was yes, the same. Yes. So the unphysical mass. Yes. Yes, so it's not the physical mass, but the unphysical mass scale mu. 
ln mu square and one over epsilon has the same coefficient. Yes. This is the statement that you have in mind. And there are similar statements at the multi-loop level. However, that becomes more complicated because uh, the ln mu square appears in different ways in all these different diagrams. So for example, in the left diagram, you really have uh, instead of mu, so, so you have mu to the two epsilon at first. So in the left diagram, you have mu to the six epsilon because it's three loop. But in the next, you have mu to the four epsilon because it's two loop. And here you have mu to the two epsilon because it's actually one loop. It's of three loop order because of the counter term coefficients, but it's one overall loop, which gives one factor of mu to the two epsilon. And so therefore, this relationship between one over epsilon and ln mu square becomes more convoluted. You can still trace it back in a similar way, but there is not this uh, simple relationship anymore. OK, so this is a very important result. So, and uh, that forms, of course, the backbone of our procedure of how to go on in our loop evaluation and in the renormalization procedure. So we started our procedure at the n plus one loop level, compute all the one particle irreducible diagrams using the counter term Feynman rules from lower orders, which have made finite the theory at lower orders. Then this theorem applies to exactly this case, that means the divergences from such a um, combination is now a polynomial in one over epsilon and a polynomial in the external momenta and the masses. Therefore, we know that we can cancel the divergences by adding to the theory yet another counter term Lagrangian, which cancels these local terms. So therefore, to say it simply, the form of the UV divergences is the same as the form of Feynman rules derived from yet another local Lagrangian. Which is of course also relativistic and Hermitian. So in the non-Hermitian part, there cannot be divergences because the non-Hermitian part is the imaginary part which is fixed by unitarity and that is finite and we have already said that uh, dimensional regularization is agreement in agreement with unitarity. Therefore, it produces the correct imaginary parts which therefore are also finite, so the divergences can only correspond to real parts and therefore to Hermitian Lagrangians. And it is local because uh, the result is a local divergence. And uh, please note that this locality of the divergences corresponds to the fact that the non-local terms had been defined unambiguously by causality and analyticity. They are unambiguous and also finite automatically. So the divergences are only in those terms which are not fixed by anything, the local real terms. And they can be cancelled by adding a local Hermitian relativistic Lagrangian to the theory. So the um, required operators in this uh, counter term Lagrangian depend on the divergent one particle irreducible diagrams. So only diagrams with degree of divergence bigger or equal to zero matter. So therefore, um, in order to uh, know which terms in the Lagrangian in principle could arise at all, you can first of all generate a list of all green functions that are possible, calculate the overall degree of divergence for all green functions, and select the ones for which the degree of divergence is positive. This is uh, maybe a finite number. 
and then you know which operators can possibly appear in your counter term Lagrangian. All right. So with this in mind, we can now go on with our procedure at the n plus one loop level. So let us continue with our procedure. First, we now define indeed our counter term Lagrangian L counter term n plus one loop order, which we now know to exist, which cancels all the divergences. such that the theory is finite at the n plus one loop level. This is the main thing, and we now know that such a counter term Lagrangian can be found. After you have made the theory finite, or in parallel to it, there is something else you typically want to achieve, Namely, the counterterms can also have finite parts. The counterterm Lagrangian doesn't only have to contain one over epsilon poles. You are simultaneously allowed to add finite counterterms. Because remember, uh, analyticity plus unitarity fixes everything except for local uh, Hermitian parts. So uh, nothing can stop you from adding here not only one over epsilon poles, making the theory finite, but also simultaneously adding arbitrary finite parts, which are still local and Hermitian and relativistic. And actually, uh, you cannot really separate very unambiguously between divergent and finite contributions, because what is divergent and what is finite depends on the regularization method that you choose. So typically, simultaneously with this, you also add finite counterterms, uh, if required, and normally this is required, um, adjust, and adjust is always required, so you fix uh, what the finite parts are, and uh, even setting them to zero would also be one way to fix the finite parts. So adjust the finite parts of L counter term N plus one uh, to achieve two purposes. Namely, the first purpose is to restore symmetries, which may be broken by the regularization. And this sometimes happens, um, and it will not happen probably in this lecture. So in our lecture, we will not uh, need this here. Uh, but the second part is to fulfill so-called renormalization conditions. Renormalization conditions are exactly the conditions which are, let's say, boundary conditions or requirements uh, that the theory should fulfill after renormalization, which have the purpose of defining unambiguously the finite parts. And one definition would be simply to say uh, the finite parts are zero in dimensional regularization. In other words, the counter term Lagrangian contains purely one over epsilon poles. But this is a choice which is difficult to make if you do not use dimensional regularization. So some other person who uses some other regularization method, for example, lattice uh, discretization of space-time, they would not know what it means to uh, use only one over epsilon poles. Um, so it's a choice which is possible but specific to dimensional regularization. Another choice which you might have learned about in your past quantum field theory lecture are so-called on-shell renormalization conditions, which have, for example, the requirement that you say, after adding the counter terms, my uh, green function is zero at a particular momentum choice. 
So for example, you might say at p square equal m square, the green function vanishes. Or at p square equal zero, the green function vanishes. You can always achieve this by adding a finite counter term. And so such a thing would be an on-shell renormalization condition. And uh, these are possible ways to fix the finite parts. Okay, uh, anyway, so that must be done. After you've done these steps, the theory is renormalized at the n plus one loop level, and you can go on with the iteration. So let's just write down the resulting outcome. So A, you have now a bare Lagrangian at the n plus one loop level, which is given by the classical Lagrangian L0 plus all the counter term Lagrangians up to the n plus one loop level counter term is defined such that the theory is finite at the n plus one loop level. Question? And this is basically uh, saying that the iteration from n to n plus one is complete. So at this point, we can go on and uh, do the next loop level, and uh, we know that we will succeed in renormalizing our theory at all loop orders. And then we have at all loop orders a finite theory, and the second outcome is what can we do with the finite theory? This is now a consistent quantum field theory, finite and consistent with the basic postulates, namely locality, relativity, and unitarity and causality of the S matrix. These are the most important quantum field theory postulates. They are all fulfilled in the limit epsilon going to zero, and therefore we can now compute physics. So physical results at the uh, any order, let's say n plus one loop order, are obtained how? They are obtained from these renormalized green functions. Green functions derived from Feynman rules given by the Lagrangian L bear up to this order. In other words, taking into account all the counter terms up to the loop order we are working at. And uh, then the green functions are finite and the physical result is of course obtained in the limit epsilon going to zero. So by taking the limit epsilon going to zero, which exists. But there is another detail and by neglecting um, d minus four uh, dimensional parts of objects such as gamma mu, a mu of x, etc. Okay, so in for example, gamma matrices, the index mu would in dimensional regularization run from zero to d minus one. And so you have a superfluous set of gamma matrices. And you simply ignore all these additional gamma matrices which are not existing in four dimensions. You set them to zero. So this is not mathematically contained in the limit epsilon going to zero. So if you have a function which depends on the variable epsilon, there you set epsilon to zero, but here epsilon doesn't appear. There is just a set of additional gamma matrices and you set them to zero by hand on top of taking the limit. So this is what you do. These quantities are called evanescent. So the statement would be that in the finite theory, you set all the evanescent quantities to zero. And then you have constructed a complete 
four-dimensional relativistic quantum field theory, which is in line with all basic postulates. And uh, in this way, you have renormalized the theory. OK, any questions? Yeah. Correct in what sense, whether it makes it finite or something else. Yeah. So only by calculating the whole set of diagrams. That is the only way. Yeah. Um, in, the beginning, in the beginning, you said that the renormalization, renormalization scheme is necessary because of the vivified operator products. And it kind of feels like we're setting up a wrong theory and correcting it iteratively. Why can't we just set up a correct theory? <laughs> The correct theory would be the regularized theory. So, um, but okay, in dimensional regularization, you kind of circumvent the operators, but uh, there would be also ways to regularize directly the operators. For example, uh, if you set up a space-time lattice, this is lattice field theory, uh, then you replace space-time by a finite lattice where uh, you have a finite lattice spacing and also a finite number of lattice points. So you have both an ultraviolet regularization because you have a minimum distance and also an infrared regularization because you have also a maximum distance. Uh, and then on these finite number of lattice points you define the field operators. This basically becomes then uh, an ordinary quantum theory, not a quantum field theory with a finite set of degrees of freedom. And uh, then uh, the distribution product become ordinary operator products and everything is defined. And then you would set up your theory in this way. You can compute everything, but you go through the same procedure. And at the end of the day, you take the limit where the number of lattice points goes to infinity and the lattice spacing goes to zero then you encounter the same divergencies and you renormalize the theory by adding some counter terms to your uh, definition in the Lagrangian. And then again, you encounter a finite uh, continuum uh, quantum field theory as a limiting theory. But it never happens that, I mean, okay, this would be kind of uh, maybe also a dream of a mathematical physicist to set up a mathematical structure where the operator products are directly defined. And there are also approaches in these directions, but they are calculationally not so well developed. And uh, therefore, in perturbation theory, we rely basically on Feynman diagrams and not on the operators. So, yep. um, so I define that, um, and so depending on how I define these counter terms, I will have different expressions for, for Green's function, for mm -hmm, the mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Green's function. Yes. How at the end I get agreement with the physics, because the physics is... Very good. So we should discuss this also in the next lesson. Um, but indeed, uh, in the beginning, I uh, had a condition. We have correctly renormalized up to n loop level. And here you now see there is not one way which is correct, but there is um, an infinite number of ways to make it correct. Namely, the divergences are unique, but the uh, finite parts of the counter terms are basically your choice. And so this is. Uh, this, this is what you have to achieve, uh, cancel the divergences, uh, and then um, you get an infinite family of correct renormalizations by shifting around finite parts. And uh, the theories uh, arising in this way, they simply differ by the parametrization. Uh, the parameters appearing in the Lagrangian have different meanings. And person A calculates with one set of finite parts and uh, the electric charge means one thing. Person B calculates with different finite parts and their electric charge means something else. But they would be able to relate electric charge A is equal to electric charge B plus higher order corrections. And if they use this relationship, then all observables become equal. So the physical content of the theory is actually unambiguous and it is uniquely fixed, but the parametrization is up to you. 
And basically, it is as simple as this. If you have some physical result, let's say you predict some observable as a function of one parameter. Of course, uh, this is your parameter, person A. Nobody can stop a person B to define a parameter of person B equal to any function f of C A. Or maybe let's do it the other way around. So you simply like this parametrization better. You put it in, and then you get this. You have reparametrized your theory. The theory is, of course, the same. All relationships between observables cannot change in this way. But the formulas expressed in terms of CA or CB look different, of course. But this is exactly what happens, nothing more than this. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, not necessarily constants, but the relationships between observables. So the physical content of the theory lies in the relationship between observables. So if you measure uh, one observable, you can predict the second one as a function of the first. But typically, predictions work by using some parameters, like charges, masses, and so on. Uh, and the parameters might not be directly observables themselves. So you predict many observables as a function of many unphysical input parameters. You could, in principle, completely eliminate these unphysical input parameters and directly express all observables in terms of some other set of basic observables. And then you would completely eliminate this freedom of parametrization. And uh, that might be the choice of person B that they say, okay, I do not like these unphysical parameters, I replace them by basic observables, yes. Can we say something like that the theory is uniquely determined just by the divergencies of this uh, L0 diagram? The theory is, in that sense, you see it, it is basically uniquely determined by L0. Once you specify L0 as the start of the iteration, everything else follows automatically up to those ambiguities in the parametrization. So I, I mean, if it's uh, uniquely defined just by looking at the divergences of L0, not even looking at L0? It's not uniquely defined by the divergences. Okay. Yeah, no. And they drop out at the end anyway, so they are unphysical. Okay. Then let us continue on Wednesday. On Wednesday, I might do a little bit of lecture, but for sure we will also continue with the exercise sheet. Depending on how far we get, I might do a little bit of lecture too. Oh. Ah. Okay, um, so welcome back to the EFT lecture. Um, today we will finish our chapter on renormalization. And uh, to quickly finish it, um, I would like to highlight three further points um, with the title Properties of Counterterms and Renormalization Schemes. Namely, I would like to tell you a little bit more details on the Baer Lagrangian and how it can look like. Uh, we will see that it can be obtained by, a, uh, let's say, um, a recipe called renormalization transformation. Uh, and we will also see under what conditions such a renormalization transformation actually works. Um, then we will discuss uh, a little bit more renormalization conditions or equivalently renormalization schemes, such as on-shell scheme versus MS bar scheme and so on. And finally, we discuss also renormalization scheme changes and the three parameters of the theory. We alluded to this already last time. Okay, so let us begin with the Baer Lagrangian in general. And remember, the whole discussion is basically a blueprint. Examples will form the rest of the semester. But here I summarize basically general statements um, uh, which are always valid. And so in general, 
we know um, about the Bayer Lagrangian only what comes out of the theorems that we discussed the last time. And the theorems tell us that uh, there always exists a Bayer Lagrangian which makes the theory finite. And what we know about it is that it is a local relativistic Hermitian Lagrangian. That's all. Therefore, in general, we know that it can be written um, as a sum with coefficients. Let's call them Ci bare times operators Oi, where these are coefficients. And uh, these are local Hermitian relativistic operators. And uh, operators mean that these are constructions out of the field operators and derivatives of the theory. Obviously, the set of all local Hermitian relativistic operators forms a vector space. And uh, therefore, you can here choose a basis in this vector space. And the statement can be written as saying that the Bayer Lagrangian is just some linear combination um, of uh, the operators in this vector space. So let's say we can choose a basis. And only if you choose a basis, the values of the coefficients are obviously unique. Um, but there always exists such a um, construction of the Bayer Lagrangian. OK, now uh, there can be two further conditions. So this is still very general. And of course, there are infinitely many such operators. Therefore, in principle, the Bayer Lagrangian can contain infinitely many terms. And uh, sometimes uh, you can place additional restrictions on which operators can actually appear. And the first kind of restriction comes from power counting. Remember that the theorems that we discussed contain precise information about the power counting degree. Not uh, any operator is necessary to cancel divergencies in general, but uh, you know that the divergencies can only appear for particular green functions with particular power counting. Therefore, you can learn something about the necessary operators based on power counting rules. But what is the outcome of this analysis depends on the case. And so let me just give you an example here, which is uh, very important. Namely, for example, if the three-level Lagrangian L0 contains only renormalizable interactions of dimension four or less, like in the standard model or QED or QCD, then something important holds. So if, uh, so if L0 contains only dimension uh, at most four operators, which is equivalent to dimension uh, zero or bigger coefficients. Okay. So the coefficients are dimensionless or they are mass parameters or mass square parameters, nothing like one over mass. Uh, and uh, there is another condition which uh, is often not uh, written out, but let me write it. And uh, the propagators behave as uh, given by dimensional analysis. And let me just give you a counter example such that you see uh, why that is an important condition. So a counter example where this is not the case is for example the following. Take a vector field propagator. Um, in unitary gauge then uh, the propagator Feynman rule is minus i divided by p square minus m square 
times g mu nu minus p mu p nu divided by m square. And then you see the um, dimensionality is 1 over p square. The unit is 1 over p square, but if p goes to infinity, it doesn't go down like 1 over p square, but it goes like p to the 0 because of this term here. And uh, that violates power counting. And uh, if the theory contains such propagators, then what I am saying does not apply. And uh, that is, however, a rare case. And most of the time, in most theories, including gauge theories where you have arc psi gauges, um, what I will say is true. Namely, if the Lagrangian contains only dimension four or less operators, uh, the divergences apply, uh, appear only for dimension four or less operators, and therefore the bare Lagrangian needs only to contain dimension four or less operators. So then the same applies to and then you know uh, that it is sufficient to extend this sum here over all dimension four or less operators, and there is typically a finite number of them only. So, and uh, you can do uh, further analyses by power counting, which uh, apply to cases where the Lagrangian contains higher dimensional operators and so on. But let's not do that here. This is just an indication that power counting in general is able to give you interesting relationships. The second condition which applies to the bare Lagrangian is symmetries. If the theory contains symmetries, um, and the symmetries are preserved in the regularization and renormalization procedure, then the bare Lagrangian also contains um, symmetries, and therefore the operators are restricted by symmetries. Let's just write this down. If L0 has a symmetry, which is preserved by the regularization, and we use here specifically dimensional regularization, L bear will reflect the symmetry. And what that means in detail might also depend on the case. Um, it is, of course, quite complicated in the case of um, Young-Mills theories, but uh, again, this is just an indication. Overall, you can say the following. Uh, you can do an a priori analysis um, based on the definition of your theory, and the a priori analysis will give you some information about which operators can appear in the bare Lagrangian, and you will get some certain set um, of operators which are possible, and then you know uh, a priori that the Bayer Lagrangian can be written as some uh, linear combination of operators in this particular set. And if you know this, then you can now infer something about renormalization transformations. So this is basically now an outcome of uh, this line of thought. So often it is a priori clear that you can write the, or you have written the tree level Lagrangian as a sum of some coefficients times certain operators. And then these operators are all possible operators of dimension four or less, or all operators which have a certain symmetry. And then the bare Lagrangian turns out to be a sum with some other coefficients, but of the same set of operators. So the point is that uh, this uh, sum extends over the same set.
and you can do it in both directions. Either you start with a classical Lagrangian, then you do this analysis, and it turns out that the Bayer Lagrangian requires only operators of exactly the same set. Then you have this statement, or you do the analysis, you figure out uh, which set is necessary in the Bayer Lagrangian. You discover, oops, uh, the classical Lagrangian doesn't contain all these operators, so therefore let me modify in hindsight the classical Lagrangian such that I um, incorporate the missing operators, and then after this, uh, both Lagrangians contain the same set of operators, just with different coefficients. And if this is the case, then uh, the renormalization transformation recipe works, which is a practical recipe. So we get a practical recipe, namely the Bayer Lagrangian is obtained from the classical Lagrangian. by what is called a renormalization transformation. Which is um, of the sort fields go to bare fields, which are written as, uh, as a sketch some square root of z times the original field. Parameters like gi become bare parameters, which are written as uh, gi plus delta gi, and so on. And let us specify what these terms mean. So there are, is a standard um, language associated uh, to this here. So these are called bare quantities. Bare fields or bare parameters. Uh, these objects here are renormalized parameters. But at the same time as being renormalized, they are also, uh, by construction, the parameters which appear in the tree-level Lagrangian, or in other words, the classical Lagrangian, so they are also tree-level parameters. They appear in the tree-level Lagrangian. Therefore, as we said, the loop expansion is an expansion in h-bar. So these parameters do not contain h-bar. They are classical three-level parameters. And these are renormalization constants. We are the term renormalization constant is actually not a good name. It's called like this, but they are functions of epsilon because they contain one over epsilon poles. And also, they are regarded as functions of the renormalized parameters. So, because they are calculated order by order, and at uh, the lowest order you have this at your disposal, so at the next order this will become a function of the tree level parameter, and so on. And uh, in perturbation theory, these delta gi, they will be expanded as a, a power series in the original parameters. Okay, so this is the setup. And this is obviously the practical recipe that you find in many textbooks. And um, we have clearly seen how it arises from the basic theorems of renormalization. So this is the first point I wanted to mention today. Um, such renormalization transformations work. Um, there are some uh, tacit uh, conditions under which they work. Basically, uh, you need to have all operators that are ultimately necessary already in the tree-level Lagrangian. Then it works. Uh, if you have forgotten something, 
uh, then it will not work, but then it's basically your fault, and not the fault of the theory. Good, let's uh, keep it at this point. Do you have questions to the renormalization transformation? Exactly, so that would be uh, the possibility by which you can save the day if uh, sometimes an operator really turns out to be not in zero at a higher order but you want to set it to zero at lower, lower orders because you just want to match to something that you want to achieve then uh, that is the possibility to write down a parameter which happens to be zero but it gets a symbol um, uh, uh, which um, turns out to be non-zero at higher orders. And then this is just a special case where one of the GIs vanishes, but the delta GI doesn't vanish. And uh, you introduce a symbol, and on the symbolic level, uh, the renormalization transformation applies. But in, in that case, how does this property even limit our possibilities? How does it help us? Because well, it doesn't limit our possibility, and that is why you can always achieve that the renormalization transformation works. However, you must be aware of those parameters which you have set to zero, otherwise it will fail. So for example, if, and uh, I will, I think, did I already construct the exercise? Um, if you look at the exercise sheet uh, problem two, the last part of problem two, then uh, this answers exactly your question. Namely, there is an exercise where you have forgotten some term in the classical Lagrangian, and by looking at the <coughs> divergences, you discover the missing term, and then afterwards you put it back into the original Lagrangian. So that's exactly this case. Other questions? Then let us go to the second point. So the second point is on renormalization conditions. And uh, also known as renormalization schemes. This is basically the same. Um, so, uh, and what I typically do is I want to simply say what does it mean to choose a renormalization scheme and there are many different equivalent ways how you can think about it and all of these equivalent ways are important. That is why I simply write down all of them. So a renormalization scheme and renormalization conditions are those conditions which fix the finite parts of the renormalization constants, or in the language of last time, they fix the finite parts of the counterterm Lagrangian and the bare Lagrangian. Remember, uh, the main task for us at the moment is to cancel the divergences, but along with it, there is absolutely the possibility to add local Hermitian relativistic finite parts at every order of perturbation theory, and these finite parts uh, become part of the definition of the theory and they must be chosen somehow. And this is uh, the way they are chosen. So renormalization conditions amount to choosing um, the finite parts of counterterms and the counterterm Lagrangian. And let me simply say uh, delta GI. And by this I mean all renormalization constants and all counterterms, but let's just formulate everything uh, in terms of this. And when I say choosing it, it means, of course, we work in perturbation theory, um, and uh, when we choose it, we choose it as a specific function, maybe a perturbative function, of the actual parameters of the theory as a function of, and let me again simply say, the GI. The renormalized parameters. But that's like the full set, so... Uh, yes, 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 yes. 
And uh, so there may be mass parameters, coupling constants, whatever. Uh, everything that appears as a parameter can appear here. So this is the basic thing that we want to achieve by choosing the renormalization scheme or the renormalization conditions. And that is equivalent to choosing <coughs> how we split the bare parameters into renormalized parameters plus renormalization constants. So you might think that uh, initially you start with a bare quantity, you split it into a divergent part and a finite part, but the split is obviously not unique. You can shift around finite parts between the two quantities and how you shift it around is fixed by the renormalization conditions. If you fix uh, this delta GI uh, in some way, then you can calculate Feynman diagrams and they are then completely unambiguously defined. Uh, so you can calculate even physical quantities, observables, and you will get a formula. Which formula do you get? This depends on how you have chosen the delta GI. So the uh, scheme choice fixes the formula um, for physical quantities. And that means we fix the properties of renormalized renormalized green functions and functional form for uh, them. So whether uh, some observable looks like g square plus g to the fourth or g square plus one half g to the four or g square minus g to the fourth, uh, all of this is possible by choosing the renormalization scheme. So that means what you have also chosen is the relationship between the renormalized quantities and observables. you have fixed how observables are related to the renormalized parameters. And this in turn means that by choosing the scheme and assuming that the theory actually describes reality, so the observables are fixed by nature, if you fix the functional dependence between observables and the parameters, what it means is you fix also the numerical value of those parameters. So the numerical value will depend on the scheme choice. So all of this is equivalent and the equivalence means that you should have all of this in mind and it also means that you can impose the renormalization conditions in different ways. You can for example impose a renormalization condition by saying uh, explicitly my choice is delta GI is a pure one over epsilon pole and the finite part is zero. A very direct and simple definition corresponding to the so-called MS bar minimal subtraction scheme. Then you would use this and uh, everything else would follow. But you could also say the opposite. For example, you might say I want that the uh, uh, coupling constant alpha has the value 1 over 137 exactly. Then it fixes also uh, how you need to split uh, your G into uh, the bare parameter into renormalization constants. You will get some particular finite part for this as well. And you can do everything in between as well. You might say, I want that my observable is a particular function of the coupling. That is done in the so-called on-shell scheme, where you say that uh, the physical mass of a particle is directly equal to the renormalized mass. M in the theory is the physical mass. Okay, so that is an example of this. Very simple example, extremely important example, obviously. And in general, however, the physical mass is not equal to the mass parameter, but is given by the mass parameter plus some higher order corrections. And so uh, this would be often applied to masses. And uh, 
So therefore, all of these equivalent statements are important and used in practice to set up different renormalization schemes. And by the way, the numerical value is uh, actually important. So for example, have you heard about, I think you have probably heard about MS bar scheme and on-shell renormalization scheme. So one important parameter is the electromagnetic fine structure constant alpha. Just to give you an idea, so alpha in the on-shell scheme has the value 1 over 137 with some decimal places. But there is also an alpha in the MS bar scheme, uh, which then depends on a mass. Let's call alpha MS bar at MZ. Um, and this has a value about 128 with some decimal places. And so you see a 6, 7% difference, quite a large difference between the two values. And if you know that typically in QED, we measure things up to per mil or a better level, such a 6% difference is obviously very important. So these are differences coming from different choices of the renormalization scheme, and both are important. This has a very simple value for the renormalization constant. And this, on the other hand, has a very simple relationship to observables. So therefore, both schemes have their pros and cons. Similarly, the top mass, there is an on-shell value for the top quark mass, which is really the physical top mass. Does anybody know what is the top quark mass? Very good. So it depends on the exact measurement, but it's about 172 to 174, depending on the experiments. Let's call it 172. But then there would also be an MS bar value of the top mass. Again, this would depend on the uh, energy, let's say M top. And then this is again much different. Um, here I do not know by heart the value, but it might be something like 163 GeV. So uh, again, uh, quite a dramatic difference. So it is important to know also in communicating results uh, to, s to state which scheme you are working in. And if you look at the measurement tables of experiments, uh, measurement of these masses, for example, measurement of the alphas, of course it is also important for experiments to state which alpha and which top mass they are talking about. All right, uh, any questions to renormalization schemes? Yep. So even if they have uh, different numerical values, a physical process will be a different function of this. That is the point. And there will be the exactly. Same, same yeah, yeah. Value That's exactly where the value comes from. And so looking at this here, uh, the functional dependence between uh, alpha and the observable changes, so in, uh, and also here the functional dependence between the parameter and the measured top mass is different. So in this case, basically, the parameter is equal to the measured top mass. Here it is not equal, but there is a calculable function between this quantity and the measured top mass. That's where the value comes from. And then, of course, you can, of course, also calculate the difference in theory. You can predict what the difference has to be. That actually comes next because now I wanted to discuss scheme changes. And we alluded to this question already the last time. So here I want to give you now a little bit more detailed answer. So let us discuss scheme changes, such as changes between the different alphas or the different top masses. And uh, here I assume that we are working with a fixed regularization. And uh, concretely, we work in dimensional regularization. And this uh, mu unphysical mass scale is now fixed. That is part of the regularization procedure. Then it is clear from everything that we have said and from the construction that the physical results of anything depend only on the bare Lagrangian. It is not written anymore, but that is clear. The physics depends only 
on L pair. Because ultimately we calculate all Feynman diagrams from the Feynman rules in the Bayer Lagrangian. So if you know the Bayer Lagrangian, then you know what the uh, final physical results are. And that does not depend on how anybody has split the Bayer Lagrangian into renormalized plus counterterm Lagrangians, because only the sum ultimately matters for the Feynman rules. And that means that the physics is unchanged. If you do, and again, let's just do it for a coupling constant G, you have some renormalization scheme one plus delta G in this renormalization scheme one would give the bare coupling constant. And if that is the same as G in some renormalization scheme two plus delta G in renormalization scheme two. So if the bare quantities in two schemes are the same, then it is a priori clear that the final physical results for everything will also be the same. So it doesn't matter how you split the bare quantities into renormalized and counterterm quantities. What changes, of course, is what is the tree level part of the calculation? That will be different. But if you sum up all orders, then the difference will vanish. And so that means if you want to relate two schemes, you can simply do this. G R S1 is equal to G R S2 plus delta G R S2 minus delta G R S1. And here you have a relationship which is calculable because if you know what is the scheme definition in both schemes, then you can calculate the delta G as a function of the original parameters and uh, you get a calculable relationship between the two renormalized parameters. And this would allow you, for example, to calculate those differences here on the upper blackboard. So this here, uh, that would be in principle a function of GRS2, that would be a function of GRS1, but then you can iterate the equation and write the right hand side either purely as a function of GRS2 or purely as a function of GRS1. And it is a, let's say, in general power series in either GRS1 or GRS2. By iteration, you can achieve this. So, and then you get ultimately such a formula which I sketched the last time. So, the parameter in one scheme are just some function of the parameters in another scheme. And then you have obviously related the two schemes, and it is clear that the physics in the two schemes ca cannot change, it must remain the same but what the parameters mean has changed and uh, the difference is um, uh, expressed by this formula. So that means the physics is unambiguous. It is fixed by the theory, so relations between observables are fixed by the theory, uh, but different schemes uh, are simply different parametrizations. So this is the important outcome of the discussion. Therefore, uh, the schemes um, do not amount to changing the physical content of the theory. Therefore, there is just one theory, like there is one QED, but you can use and define QED using different renormalization schemes, um, which uh, might be convenient for your problem at hand. You can optimize the scheme to what you want to achieve, but it doesn't change the content of QED. 
and how schemes are related is given in practice by such a relationship. Therefore, as an ultimate conclusion, we can also say something on the three parameters of the theory. So, according to everything we have said, ultimately uh, everything depends on the bare Lagrangian and the bare quantities, but the bare quantities are in any scheme expressed in this way in terms of renormalized quantities plus renormalization constants and the renormalization constants are functions of the renormalized parameters. Therefore, ultimately everything becomes a function of the renormalized parameters of your theory. And the renormalized parameters are exactly the parameters which appear in the tree level Lagrangian. Therefore, everything is a function of the parameters of the tree level Lagrangian. So ultimately, all results are functions. Let's stress finite functions after renormalization of the parameters in L0, the classical Lagrangian. And if the number of these parameters is finite, the theory is predictive. If not, then see you later. Okay. So, because in general uh, you would say that a theory must be predictive in the sense that there must be only a finite number of input parameters. That means in practice you measure or do a finite number of experiments. This determines the three parameters of the theory, then everything is totally fixed, even numerically, so you can afterwards predict an infinite number of new observables and test the theory. If the theory contains an infinite number of free parameters, that doesn't really work so directly, but we will see uh, how ineffective field theories, even if we have an infinite number of free parameters, formally, um, we still have some predictive power. Okay, but this is the end of our discussion on renormalization. Let us stop here unless you have questions and then we turn to the exercise sheet.